talk about rage games. Sometimes they're called Twitch or Precision platformers like Super Meat Boy, Thousand and One Spikes, or Wings of V, but they don't have to be platformers. Hotline Miami, Dark Souls, or even many roguelikes could fit into this category. They're not for everyone, but despite the name of the genre, they're some of my personal favorite types of games out there. The goal of a rage game is to have such high difficulty that when the player finally conquers the challenge, the result is overwhelming accomplishment. Often this means they'll have to retry over and over again, learning patterns and perfecting their movement, but the key is making sure the obstacles in your way are fair, and that you have total control over your character. However, this might seem too repetitive or require too much dedication for some, resulting in many just quitting along the way. Another genre I love is boss rush games. Fury was one of my favorite titles last year for much the same reason. Extreme trial that leads to elation when you triumph. So when Cuphead finally came onto the scene, a precision platformer combined with a boss rush game that has some of the most unbelievable animation I've ever seen, you'd think it would have been a perfect 10 out of 10 for me. Tutorial jokes aside, it's an incredibly difficult game, but the unique art style drew in many players that weren't used to this type of challenge. So what we're left with is a bunch of gamers arguing about how hard is too hard, the pros and cons of difficulty settings, and my favorite, the elitists assuming everyone complaining just isn't good enough or worth the time of day. But I'm not interested in those arguments. What I want to focus on today is if Cuphead is successful at being a good rage game. Does the task leave you with a sense of satisfaction where you go, Woo! I did it! What an awesome boss! Or does it fall flat where you find yourself saying, Oh man, finally this boss is over. Unfortunately for me, I ended up in the second camp more than I would have liked. I want to break down why this is, but I have to give you a few disclaimers before we dive in. One, this is just my opinion. I wish it was assumed by viewers that a creator's opinion is implied, but because of the analytical nature of my videos, some people take my word as law. So know going in that if you enjoyed every single second of Cuphead, that is perfectly fine. This is why I'm going to try and be as detailed as possible, however, and hopefully show you rather than tell you why I felt the way I did when playing Cuphead, to put some evidence behind my words. And two, you gotta understand that when a particular clip shows me messing up or dying to something that looks like it could have been avoided, it's a lot harder in the actual heat of battle to see and evade these things. If you analyze any footage of someone playing a game, you're gonna find lots of places where they could have dodged here or been more efficient there, but remember that they're not gonna be perfect. So when I mention a specific part of a boss that I felt was frustrating, realize that hindsight is 2020, and I probably notice my mistakes when I look back at it too. But more importantly, it doesn't change how I felt when I was actually playing. In other words, cool it with the get good stuff, and I'll try to be as objective as possible. Deal? Okay, so to be fair, Cuphead has a lot of boss fights that are really stellar. The entire first world felt great, and Captain Briny Beard and Grim Matchstick were some of my favorite encounters in the whole game. They also happen to be some of the ones I struggled on the most, but every time the battles felt fair and winnable. I just needed to put in the work and learn how to prevent getting hit the next time. In fact, after taking about an hour to finally beat Grim Matchstick, I destroyed him first try when I streamed the game later that night. This is the foundation of a rage game, presenting a seemingly insurmountable challenge, but then slowly mastering it with each new attempt. King Dice is a wonderful last marathon before the final boss. Each individual match is totally manageable and only has one or two patterns to memorize, but the struggle comes from combining them all together in one shot. When I finally reached the end and realized I had to battle King Dice himself, I was so furious, but in a good way. The duel achieves this because most of the difficulty is put into your own hands. You decide which space to land on by parrying the dice, so you can gain more health or take a break at the safe markers. And King King Dice only has one set of attacks as well. It's all still challenging, but split up into digestible chunks. The problem is that not every boss feels this way. A couple of key factors have easily changed them from being motivationally punishing to purely aggravating. The first aspect isn't a big one, but I think it did add to the annoyance, and that's the lack of visible health. Now, a Cuphead does technically have health bars, but it only shows them to you after you die. What? Are you kidding me? You 
if I had known I was that close, I would have just powered through instead of hanging back. Ugh. I think adding these in post-mortem only serves to raise your irritation. But if they had been present the entire fight, it probably would have changed tactics completely and let you feel more in control. A huge reason games like Dark Souls thrive is because you have to decide second to second what your next move is gonna be. Whether you dodge and stay cautious or move in guns a blazing will depend on how much health the enemy has left. And it adds to the satisfaction knowing that you masterminded the entire bout with the right moves at the perfect times. Without knowing the boss's health, you're often just shooting in the dark, hoping that it's enough to kill it. But then, oh man, nope, guess that wasn't enough. And then when you actually do best it, normally it catches you off guard, minimizing that instant feeling of ecstasy. The difference is pretty apparent. Oh man, one more hit, okay, okay, okay. Here we go, and yes! Versus, uh, okay, what's he doing? What's he doing? How much more health does he have? Come on, come on. Oh, oh, okay, I guess I beat him then, all right. This may not be true for everyone, but I know for myself it felt like a combination of surprise and relief, instead of gratification and accomplishment. Those may sound similar, but they actually are worlds apart. Now, what's interesting is that other games can still give you that feeling without a health bar. Volgar the Viking is one of my all-time favorite games, and every time I conquered a boss I was ecstatic, but it doesn't show you enemy health. What's the difference? Well, I think a huge part is that there's almost nothing random in these encounters. Everything is calculated, and you can predict what will happen next and respond accordingly. Cuphead has a lot of randomness, and I'm talking about more than just which attack the boss decides to do next. That type of randomness can be a good thing, causing the player to think on their feet. Entering a brand new fight and getting completely walloped is part of the fun. You learn patterns and overcome eventually. It felt satisfying to learn that you can avoid Wally Warble's colored eggs by simply going above or below them on the left side of the screen, or that you can avoid damage from Phantom Train no matter where your trolley car is during some of the phases. But the kind of randomness that Cuphead has often leads to unavoidable damage, or unpredictable deaths. Let me give you some examples. When Beppy the Clown enters his horse riding phase, he has a move where he shoots out horseshoes in the middle of the screen in a straight line. But there's also a roller coaster that comes by on a fixed timer that you need to jump on and avoid passengers. Because of the random nature of when Beppy will enter this attack and when the roller coaster will drive by, this can lead to getting cornered and taking damage some of the time. Of course you could just use the smoke bomb power up to dodge through them, but that's not the point. What if I'd rather use another charm instead? Every attack should be avoidable if the player has enough skill. This just feels like bad luck with no way to avoid it. Calla Maria has something very similar with her last phase, where she'll launch out a green blast that'll turn you into stone until you mash enough buttons to break free. This move has very little telegraph, and takes place in a small winding shaft, with spike walls and green bubbles floating by as well. So more often than not, you basically have to take the hit and pray that another obstacle doesn't show up in your way before you can move again. This is another great example of how it might look like there's something I could do to prevent this, but in the moment it felt helpless and caused many frustrations frustrating deaths at the very end of the fight. Even the final boss, the devil, has a trick like this. When he becomes a dragon and slithers on screen from either side, the demons in the background will randomly enter from the left or the right. But if they just happen to walk in as you're stuck in the corner because of the dragon attack, it can be near impossible to avoid getting hit from them as they enter screen. You don't have enough time to kill them with this little room. Not to mention that these pillars in the foreground impede your vision so you can't see what's happening at all. In fact, this is weird, it only happened on the left side of the screen, but even when a demon isn't present, all still take damage from seemingly nothing at all when the devil does this attack. I would love to know what hit me, but I can't see it. This also happens with Dr. Call's robot. All the junk in the foreground makes it very difficult to see everything that can hit you clearly, and when you have to avoid so many projectiles at once, this can feel extremely defeating. On top of all this, there are many other situations that while I could avoid them with enough practice or planning ahead, it still felt limiting and thwarting in the moment. Like the moving cloud platforms combined with the flame kids jumping up at you during Grim Matchstick's fight. They do have a telegraph and will leap a certain way based on your position, but depending on the cloud placement, a degree of this feels out of your control. Or during Rumor Honeybottom's middle phase, she'll send out magic triangles or spheres at you. But again, depending on how the platforms pan out, good luck. It's important to point out that because of the random nature of these factors, this doesn't happen every single battle. But over time, it starts to wear down your morale and enthusiasm, until you hope you just get a better pattern next time. 
Lastly, some of the bosses in Cuphead simply have too much going on at once. Every brawl other than the first one against the Root Pack has multiple obstacles you need to look out for at the same time, which inherently isn't a bad thing. Captain Briny Beard at one point could have the barrel at the top, the ship shooting cannonballs, dogfish jumping onto the dock, and the pink squid's pellets coming at you, but all of these are predictable and avoidable with the right timing and prep. On the other hand, scuffles like Dr. Call's Robot have so many elements going on at the same time, it can get overwhelming really quickly depending on which part of the body you take out first. Two obstacles at the same time are perfectly manageable, and even three can be alright some of the time, but Cuphead tends to pile it on thick especially for the final phases of a lot of bosses, which can be the most disheartening because when you die you have to do the entire match over. It's discouraging to do so well then get demolished by too much chaos in the final moments. Even worse, sometimes I felt like I should just restart the fight on purpose if I take a dumb hit early on because I know I'll need the extra health to survive in the later stages. I should reinforce that not every boss in Cuphead felt this way, and while it is obviously beatable, the feeling that it gives the player is the important factor I'm focusing on here. And this is true of any game. If you stick it out, of course you'll be able to prevail eventually, but when the game will give you scenarios that seem impossible some of the time, it can drastically halt a player's desire to want to finish it. But hey, I still enjoyed my time with Cuphead overall, and the art style truly took my breath away. The polish in the animation is so apparent, and in my opinion it's joined the prestigious ranks of relatively short experiences that are still worth every penny. I'm curious to know your impressions of Cuphead. Did you feel like the difficulty was satisfying? What impressed you most, and what are some other ways you think it could have improved? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. I hope you understand where I'm coming with this video. The goal wasn't to harp on Cuphead, but rather analyze why the best rage games of all time are held in such high regard, and look at what Cuphead could have done to be considered one of them. But I hope designers will continue to think outside the box, and that we'll see games in the future rise to the top and give us some of the most gratifying challenges we've ever seen. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I just wanted to remind you that a great way to help support the channel and get some swag in the process is by going to the Snowman merch store. In fact, as of right now, we've added the Please No Tank Tops tank tops. So if you've ever wanted to tell people that you don't care what they think about your fashion sense, hey, there you go, now you can. So check out all kinds of awesome merch at teespring.com stores slash snowman gaming. And thanks for your support. Later.